Okay, so let me start with the um, with something that has been already uh, said several times uh, in many of the talks. So I'm, I'm just starting off with the um, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, which I'm writing over here. Um, and I'm going to consider the um, uh, three-dimensional case. So yeah, um, there's probably one of my sons already coming over. Um, okay, so I will have a, a viscosity, which is non-zero, which is denoted by nu in my case. And then I have the usual term, which is the Laplacian of the velocity v. Okay, and, and as usual, I have the divergence free condition, divergence of v equal to zero. Okay, and uh, what you can find in uh, pretty much any reference in turbulence about the Kolmogorov K41 theorem is that if I introduce the kinetic energy uh, at time t, which is just the um, uh, square of the L2 norm of my solution. By the way, let's, let us just assume that we are on the periodic torus, okay? Uh, so let me assume that we are on the periodic torus. So I'm just integrating the total, uh, the local, uh, the, the, the kinetic energy density, which gives me uh, this expression. And then I'm just reading from uh, page 75 of um, Uriel's book. So hypothesis uh, H3, uh, the turbulent flow has a finite non-vanishing mean rate of dissipation per unit mass. Okay, so let me just say that what I would like to, um, uh, to show is the, um, um, okay, so first of all, uh, if I'm assuming that um, the solution is regular, I'm going to have this identity. So when I differentiate E, I just get my uh, viscosity here, a negative sign, and then I find the L2 norm of the um, derivative of my velocity. And uh, so what is supposed to happen is that uh, very likely um, this object over here, this dissipation should actually be big O of one, or in other words, binded away from zero uh, independently on you. Okay. Uh, so this, yeah, I'm passing actually from V to U, sorry. So this should be a B. Okay, so as a mathematician, what I would actually like to do is like, I would like to show, and, and um, I believe we are extremely far from doing that. We would actually like to show that there's at least one possible instance of this happening. So some situation in which I have a sequence of um, um, solutions of Navier-Stokes with dissipation, which is going to zero, and so let me just put an index Q over here just to say that I don't want to consider a one parameter family of solutions, but just, you know, a okay. sequence. Um, okay. Yes? Is this Laplacian or a gradient of VQ? Uh, no, that is the gradient, sorry. That is my writing. Thank you very maybe much. Let me, maybe let me just do it this way, okay? Perfect, thank you. Obviously. And um, so what I would like to know now is that something like this happens even if new Q actually goes to zero. Okay, and, and let me just assume that it has something reasonable like, uh, anyway, I'm starting from an initial data, which is say, uh, uh, finite L2 energy, okay? So we're very far from doing this, um, uh, but anyway, we have a, a, a pretty powerful theorem, which was before a conjecture, and which was proved by Phil Isaac in 2018, and, and that is that if we set actually new equal to zero, so if Q in my case is equal to infinity, that is if new Q is equal to zero, that is if I have the Euler equations, then there exists in fact um, uh, uh, weak solutions V with the property that you have a Hölder continuous condition uniformly in time and space of exponent alpha, and that is going to happen for every alpha less than one over three, and with the property that the energy is not constant, as you would expect if you had a smooth solution. Okay, and um, I, I'm not, um, so, this was explained, so how the proof actually goes uh, uh, and the history was explained wonderful by 
Professor Matsumoto, and I will not even attempt at embarrass myself in trying to give my own version because I was listening to his talk and <laughs> Jesus, he's, he's done a much better job than I could actually ever possibly do. So <laughs> it's quite embarrassing actually. So let me not attempt to do that. Let me just make a remark. Um, so uh, there are, um, uh, so there, there, there was a history, there were lots of results, uh, and, but there's one feature common to all the results which actually uh, uh, happened in the literature, and that is that there is a particular uh, kind of uh, iteration mechanism which is producing these solutions. And um, well, let me just take the following provocative point of view. So this iteration mechanism is actually reaching the solution of the Euler equation through uh, uh, an iteration, so through a sequence, and this sequence is a sequence of smooth solutions of the Euler equation plus the driving force. Now, I could take actually the point of view that I would like that driving force to be the viscosity in Navier-Stokes with the vanishing uh, uh, coefficient mu q. I'm not able to do that, but I want to compare how far actually we are uh, uh, from doing that, and, and not from a mathematical point of view, but more from a qualitative point of view. I mean, from what actually I could read, for instance, in, in, in books about turbulence flow. Okay, so so this is the essence of this is the essence of my remark. So uh, 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 v is actually achieved as a limit of uh, uh, solutions of a systems which you already saw written. Uh, in a few talks, so I have the Euler equations, which I'm going to rewrite in the following way, in a way which I hope is like familiar to you. And there's going to be a right hand side over here, and this right hand side has the following form. So it is the divergence of some tensor, which I will call a circle Q. Okay. And then I have, of course, the usual divergence free condition. Okay, and so the question that I want to actually uh, um, ask is, in a sense, how far is this R circle Q to actually be the tensor which we would like to have over there? And the tensor that we would like to have over there is nu Q times d u Q, right? Of which you're computing the divergence, and then you get the Laplace. So that's what I want to do. So I want to compare R circle Q to um, what I would have which is like the UQ, okay? So to, to, to this other tensor. And of course I have the viscosity over here, so I should remember that I have a coefficient over there. Okay, and of course we are extremely far, but first of all, let me observe that once you take this point of view, even though the mysterious object in the limit is going, going to be just a very rough solution of the Euler equations, just Hölder, and it's Hölder and it's like awful, it will typically be like, you know, very nasty everywhere, a little bit like um, say, a Brian Mo Brownian motion with a lot of spikes, um, the approximating sequence is nothing bad. I mean, they're actually C infinity. And, and, and in, in a certain sense, they're e even built with an iterative formulas in which you can put your hands on, okay? So, well, first of all, let me remark the following. In all of our iterations, uh, this R circle Q has the following property. So R circle Q is traceless and it's symmetric. Okay, that is obviously not the case for the UQ, but just observe the following funny fact. Uh, if I take the divergence of the UQ plus its transpose, since UQ is actually divergence free and smooth, uh, um, uh, when the divergence eats the second term, I'm actually getting zero. So here, I just get the Laplacian of UQ, right? So, and now this guy, the UQ plus the UQ transpose actually has exactly the same structure as our circle Q, it's trace free because, it, because UQ is divergence free and it is symmetric, right? So that structure is actually correct. And so I should rather actually compare my R circle Q to uh, the symmetrization of the UQ, okay? So let me maybe write it in the following way. Okay, fair enough. And uh, I'm realizing, as Idris was commenting, that my D looks dangerously close to the Laplacian, which after all is a Greek delta, right? So let me just be uh, pedantic over here. So this is really a D. 
Okay, so now what else actually do we know on these things? So uh, a UQ, and, and, and here we're getting like closer to the philosophy of this iteration method. So UQ can be thought as the superposition of blocks. And it, in a certain sense, it's not going to look too far from looking at like a decomposition in shells in Fourier space. So these blocks, they're very similar to being uh, uh, say the Fourier expansion or like like um, uh, taking like the Fourier series of UQ, which sort of ends up at a certain scale. And uh, uh, these WI, they are just like, you know, the, the, the Fourier modes, which are li lying in some dyadic scale, for instance. Okay, so that's not entirely true. I'm cheating a little bit, actually. So what happens in the proof is that the typical, the typical uh, um, uh, Fourier, uh, 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 the typical size in Fourier space of this WI so the Fourier scale for WI um, is something which I would like to be in between, uh, say, some lambda to the power i and, uh, uh, I mean, approximately some lambda to the power i, I mean, like, you know, up to, uh, say, constants. But what really happens is that I have something nastier, which anyway, as I get closer to the Onsager, uh, uh, to the proof of the Onsager theorem, uh, is getting like like closer and closer to an exponential. So what I really have technically is something like lambda to the power b to the power minus i, and what is happening is that this b is really close to one. So I'm cheating over here. I think it's only a technical point actually, and and I would love to see a proof, even though technical, which is just using a an exponential spacing, but we actually have to do slightly worse. We have to actually choose a double exponential. Okay, so 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 that is what is happening. And um, as uh, uh, Professor Matsumoto was already uh, explaining very well, what is somewhat the philosophy of these constructions? Well, the philosophy is something like this. So I want to cook up from uh, UQ, uh, UQ plus one. And so, okay, UQ plus one is going to be equal to this UQ. Okay, and, and, and um, I want to understand what is a perturbation, which in a sense is going to like kill my previous error and is producing a solution of Euler with a new error term, but the new error term is much closer. Okay, it's, it's, it's much smaller, much closer to zero. So um, the way we do this is by taking an ansatz, which is the following. So uh, we are thinking of adding something which is very high oscillatory. Uh, uh, so almost like, you know, the Fourier modes of the next level, but driven by coefficients which are slowly changing. So it's, they're not constant coefficient, but, but you're slowly changing depending actually on the, previous, uh, 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 on the previous velocity. So you might ideally think about having some master function W and this master function depends on several entries on, on four entries. So there's going to be uh, a UQ there's going to be R circle Q, and then there's going to be some fast oscillation in the other variables. So lambda X, lambda T, okay? Um, I mean, roughly speaking, this W might actually look like something like some uh, uh, um, over some Fourier modes of coefficients AI, and here I will have these coefficients depending on UQ and R circle Q, uh, and these are like smooth functions. So these coefficients will vary, but very slowly compared to the exponentials of the Fourier expansion. And here I'm having a Fourier expansion of the form say, uh, okay, so this is maybe wrong. I mean, let me use J because I is the um, imaginary unit. And here I'm going to have Lambda and then KJ dot X uh, uh, plus maybe something in time. But it actually turns out that Mostly uh, in our constructions, we don't really need this lambda t too much. I mean, it's it's actually the time is varying uh, uh, kind of slowly. Although there are some constructions in which actually the time is going fast, so you can do both. But for the time being, let me just imagine that I'm doing something which is uh, almost stationary, okay? And the idea would be to just cook up conditions on this function w, which is going to give you this mechanism uh, so that uh, like the next error is going to be very small, right? And so um, it's actually not going to be really this way. So if you really want to be picky, I will not be able to do my perturbation in this way. I will need some correction. Um, and the correction is going to be though very small. So I don't want to take it into account, okay? 
Okay, so once you actually take this point of view, um, I, I'm claiming that you know it goes beyond beyond the the actual construction that you're using. You know whether you're using like you know Mikado flows or Beltrami flows or uh, uh, whatever actually you want to use over there, because there's a huge freedom. So what I want to point out is that there is a basic uh, um, a basic philosophy behind this, and this basic philosophy actually can be nailed down up to a certain point before you actually start uh, writing down the details of the proof. And this philosophy is like driving your construction. So you, you cannot like, you know, you can take this point of view and maybe I'm not promising that you're going to prove the theorem. That is, uh, you know, that will, will require a lot of work. But what I'm promising you is that you will get something, at least some indication of what you should do and and possibly some first theorem, which keeps you say a copy holder exponent at least, okay? And um, so now the, the name of the game is just to uh, like decide W this master function, uh, so that uh, when I'm going to compute the Euler operator on VQ plus one, okay, I'm, you notice that I'm not telling you anything about the pressure. Well, let's say the pressure will have a similar ansatz. Okay, so this guy should produce a new uh, a forcing, which is much smaller. And how do I decide the forcing? Well, the forcing I decided because I have so much freedom in my tensor. So here I would like divergence of RQ plus one uh, circle. I have so much freedom that actually what I can sh well, what I can do is I can just invert the divergence operator somewhat. Uh, there's plenty of, of, of uh, I mean, if you give me a vector field, there's plenty of matrices whose divergence it's actually going to give you this vector fit. So it's, it's more like a, uh, an abundance of them. And I would like actually to choose something which is good. But there's a canonical choice if you're like making a sort of Helmholtz decomposition at the level of tensors, right? So and let me call this canonical choice the inverse of the, um, uh, the inverse of the, um, of the divergence, right? So I'm then going to compute the inverse of the divergence on this um, very large guy. Okay, so on the green stuff. Okay, and what is the philosophy that I actually uh, am using to understand this a circle Q plus one can become much smaller, okay? Well, the philosophy is the following. Um, of course, when I'm actually computing the derivatives of this expression over here, when I'm actually computing this, uh, uh, the divergence of, uh, or, or derivatives of this expression over here, two things might happen. So the derivatives might actually hit the fast oscillating terms, or they might hit the slow oscillating terms. If the derivatives actually hit the fast oscillating terms, uh, then I get the lambda out, and this lambda is a big contribution. And I would like actually to devise my w so that uh, that term does not exist. Okay, so this gives you a PDE condition if you want on w. And the idea is that I want to kill every term which is coming out with a fast uh, uh, oscillation. Okay, so when the derivative hits the fast oscillation. So W solves a PDE. That's the first principle. So W solves a PDE in the fast variables. Uh, and there are no lambda terms in the expansion in lambda when I'm actually computing derivatives. Okay, so now what happens when I actually hit slow derivatives? Well, when I hit slow derivatives, I have expressions, hopefully, of the following type. So uh, slow derivatives look like this. Uh, they look like some Fourier coefficient, which is actually varying slowly, times something which is varying very fast. And now when I'm actually hitting this with the divergence to the minus one operator, it's a little bit like the riemann lebesgue lemma, right? So if I'm integrating actually a function which oscillates very fast, there's a one over lambda coming out. And if I'm assuming that this one over lambda is much bigger than the scale of variation of my functions bj, in other words, if I'm assuming that this lambda q 
uh, uh, is much larger than, say, the lambda q minus 1, which was the, the typical scale of oscillations for the previous addition, then this guy is actually going to be small. Okay, so I'm just saying this one is going to be of order 1 over lambda q. Okay, so you can actually run this argument every, every time except for one particular term. And the one particular term for which you cannot run this argument is due to resonances in the uh, uh, quadratic part, right? So when I'm going actually to look at divergence, and this is like the slow divergence, okay, of the resonances, and the resonances would be something like sum over j, say, k, and here I'm going to have, say, a, j, a, k, and then there's being uh, uh, w, j, tensor, uh, WK, say, if I'm, if I'm calling these guys over here um, WJ. Okay, so there's a resonance over here. So there, there will be somehow one term popping out. If you make the Fourier expansion, it's just going to be like the zero order term in which I don't have any oscillation in front, right? So that guy is when I apply the divergence to the minus one, is not going to give me anything small because I don't have any fast oscillation in front of it. But what I can actually possibly do is, since I have this divergence RQ to actually kill, I can actually couple this term with my old RQ and kind of devise the resonances in such a way uh, uh, that the resonances match actually what I had in my previous uh, 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 in my previous guy. Okay, so here is where I will actually put uh, my previous uh, error, which is R circle Q, and so I will actually use the resonances to kill the previous error. Okay, so now when you think about it, there's something which is not too far from. Um, I mean, I mean which, which is like not too far from the mechanisms which, like from the cartoon picture that you, that you get in, in, in turbulence theory in a sense, although this might sound outrageous to you. But, you know, there's first one principle, which is I'm piling up oscillations on top of previous flows, right? It's a little bit like I'm piling up eddies, if you want, though I'm not claiming these ones are really actually like, you know, physical eddies on top of each other. And they are kind of transported from the previous flow. Okay, and there's an interaction among them, which is, however, very non-trivial. I mean, these resonances are, are giving you something which is highly non-trivial. And, and how do you actually spot that you're giving something which is highly non-trivial? That is, that there is something highly non-trivial going on in your uh, 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 in your interactions. Well, you might actually look at this from an abstract point of view. You see, what I'm what I'm doing over here is I'm taking a quadratic term in an iteration. And I'm making actually this quadratic term much more important than the linear terms, right? So in this two, where I'm using the slow derivatives and this kind of fast oscillation, there will be a lot of linear terms in my uh, perturbation, right? And those linear terms, they will actually result as something small, smaller than this R circle Q. And it will be the quadratic term, which is actually killing the error. So rather than following some, 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 some kind of Newton iteration in which it's the linearization that is driving my uh, uh, iteration, it's actually the quadratic term which is winning over the linear term. So there's obviously something going on which is much more complicated than usual. Okay. Anyway, let me just uh, abstract some 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 uh, uh, informations over here. So which I think I believe they are interested. So first of all, uh, each so each WQ each P is in the expansion. So WQ plus one, which is the next uh, uh, correction, uh, interacts only, essentially only with WQ. And of course, with the next guy, with WQ plus two, but it has almost no interactions with the ones which are further away. Okay, let me just look at another thing. So B, uh, what is the size of, uh, what is the size of, um, so what is the L infinity size of this WQ plus one? Okay, so I know I'm actually landing towards the Onsager conjecture. So the size of this lambda of this WQ plus one has to be essentially uh, uh, the uh, uh, cube, uh, um, uh, the cube root of the inverse 
uh, uh, of lambda, right? So it's actually lambda q plus one uh, to the to the minus one over three, okay? So now another thing that happens is that these guys, like you know, when when you're actually computing the total kinetic energy, these various species in terms of the L two norm, they're actually not interacting uh, with each other because like you know the cross products will essentially cancel. So what is actually happening is that the total contribution in energy of these guys so is essentially lambda q plus one to the minus two thirds. And if I'm if I'm looking at Fourier, uh, I mean if I'm if I'm looking in Fourier, right? So this wq plus one is roughly occupying a a uh, say Fourier shell, which is like the sphere of radius uh, um, say lambda q plus one. Uh, uh, times a constant minus the sphere uh, of radius lambda q plus one divided by constant. So the total, I mean, like if I'm going to divide by, uh, say, the, 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 the length of the, um, uh, uh, in Fourier, what I'm actually like, you know, getting is a spectrum, which is roughly lambda q plus one uh, uh, to the minus five over three. Okay, so, so the, the energy spectrum is around lambda to the power minus five over three. Okay, so that sounds a known quantity, right? Okay. Um, let me get to another interesting observation. So let me say that I want to speculate that I would be able to actually make this um, uh, R circle Q, um, so this R circle Q, I want to speculate that I'm actually able to make it uh, roughly, or I want to compare it to, uh, you know, some viscosity, which I have actually not yet decided, uh, times duq. Okay, so what is the size of this guy? Uh, well, the size of this guy is, if I know that the uh, uh, L-infinity norm of uq is roughly lambda q to the minus 1 over 3, uh, the size of this derivative is roughly uh, lambda q to the power uh, uh, two over three, right? And what do I know about this R circle Q? Well, this R circle Q, uh, if you look back at my expansion, right? So it was like the resonances which was giving which was giving this R circle Q, right? So what you can extract actually from this identity is that roughly uh, your perturbation W has to be the square root of the previous R circle Q, right? So this guy actually must have roughly the size of lambda Q plus one to the power minus two over three, because it is what it is, I mean, this, it is roughly the square of the next perturbation, okay? So now, if I were in the ideal situation in which I don't have to use this double exponential, this lambda q plus one to the minus two thirds and lambda q to the two thirds would actually be roughly comparable. So if you look at what actually this new q should be, well, new q should be roughly lambda q plus one to the minus two thirds times lambda q to the minus two thirds, which is roughly lambda q to the minus four thirds. Okay. And um, well, you will now recognize that the typical, uh, uh, I mean, the typical scale lambda is actually going to be the cube of the inverse of the fourth uh, root of nu, right? So you probably recognize here Kolmogorov scale. Okay, so there's actually lots of it which looks like what I uh, uh, read in, in turbulence books. Of course, the only thing which is missing, I mean, only quote unquote, is that <laughs> this bloody art circle Q is actually very far from being uh, uh, a viscous, uh, you know, a viscous uh, uh, term as in uh, Navier Stokes. But what I'm, what I'm just saying is that even though this iteration looks very mysterious, and even though, you know, in, in, in the final uh, uh, analysis, what is uh, what, what people mostly focused on, which is the final product, the solution of the other equation, which is weird, 
which is only held there, which is dissipating the kinetic energy, and which is not something that you can like you know write down as an explicit formula. So it's a pretty messy thing. What is actually happening along the iteration is that we are constructing a solution to say Euler with an artificial viscosity, if you want. And what this artificial viscosity is doing is that at least at the qualitative level is doing some of the things that uh, um, you guys in physics uh, tell me a turbulent fluid should actually do. So that's what I'm outrageously claiming. Okay. So there's no, okay, so if you, if you now start worrying, you know, what is the first structural thing that you would like from this um, uh, uh, actual R circle Q to do, um, uh, to be an actual viscosity, well, the first thing that you actually should ask is that, uh, at least from my point of view, is that you want something which respects the error of uh, the, the error of time, right? So you want something which is actually dissipating the energy, not simply something which is not converging the energy, okay? So, of course, what, you, what, what I'm just saying is um, uh, something which... Uh, 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 was observed by uh, uh, Duchamp and Robert, and, and, and Robert already uh, long ago, and that is that if you're a solution of the um, uh, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, if you're a smooth solution, uh, uh, but even if you are, for instance, an admissible solution in the, in the sense of Caffarelli and Nirenberg, you have what is called an energy inequality. So for smooth solution, you would just have the local energy identity, which looks like this. And again, my V looks dangerously close to the Laplacian. Ah. Okay, so of course now here, what you recognize is that you have something in divergence form, which is going to disappear uh, once I said uh, uh, my viscosity to zero, but that is something which is not going to disappear if I believe that there's going to be uh, actual dissipation until the limit. And the something which will not disappear is this guy over there. Right, so that actually gives you something which is a negative distribution. So if you would have any hope of actually showing that there is actual dissipation, actual anomalous, anomalous dissipation in a sequence of solutions to Navier-Stokes, you should take care that whatever solution of Euler you land to in the limit is going to be a solution which dissipates the kinetic energy even locally, right? Not only globally. Okay, so suggests a strong form of the Onsager conjecture, which is actually stated uh, uh, precisely in a recent paper by Phil Isaac. Um, that below the Onsager threshold, there should be further continuous solutions which actually are locally dissipative. And of course, the local dissipation should look like 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 this, right? And on top of this, v should be l infinity in t, and then c alpha in space. Okay, and and so the purpose of my talk is actually to just tell you where do we stand over here. Now, before we we, we go on, let me just be honest. So if you tell me is this. Um, so is this advancing my, uh, uh, like say, program of trying to actually show that there are solutions of Navier-Stokes which are converging to these solutions of Euler? Uh, my honest answer would be no. I'm not seeing actually where we are advancing over there. Uh, but it certainly is a very nice conjecture and something like that you should be plausibly able to do if you're solving the other problems. So the first thing that you should bother is, you know, can actually the current technique gives you, give you at least this one, which looks much more reasonable than what you got before. Okay. By the way, uh, uh, let me just mention that uh, it is possible at the global level, and this is a theorem of um, uh, Buckmaster, um, myself, Laszlo Zekai-Hibi, and Vicol in 2018, and 
if instead of requiring this, you are actually requiring the global energy to be dissipated. So to have this inequality, if you want, uh, that is okay. And with a strict actually, and with a strict sign, okay? So now, what is interesting in this is that um, on this conjecture, we are actually, of IZ, we are actually pretty far from getting the uh, onsager exponent, right? So uh, uh, there's a theorem by IZ, and this is essentially 2018 to, let me just say maybe 2018, 2019. And the theorem is saying that, um, so there is, uh, there are solutions of uh, Euler with, which satisfy the energy inequality. Um, if alpha is less than one over 15. And uh, together with the postdoc here, I have an improvement on this. Uh, uh, um, her name is uh, Hyunjo Kwan. And what we can do is that we can actually bring the exponent down to uh, 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 one over seven. But as you can see, we're still like, you know, a certain amount far from one over three. And, and the reason is that we are not able to actually implement kind of the very last uh, um, um, uh, steps uh, 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 which which allowed us or which allowed actually Phil to get to uh, one over three. That is using these gluing techniques uh, uh, that actually Professor Matsumoto already illustrated and which kind of introduces a sort of you know temporal uh, 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 intermittency in the perturbation. So we are not able to do that. But in this paper with uh, Hinju, what we are able to do is we are able to use uh, the other technique or the other step, which actually led to one over three uh, uh, exponent, which was in a paper by Sara Daneri and Laszlo Zekaihidi, uh, which are these so-called Mikado flows. So what we're actually able to do is we're able to use these Mikado flows in an iteration, which is showing a local uh, um, um, energy inequality. Uh, so rather than going into the technicalities, let me just go back to the basic philosophy and tell you uh, what actually is the reason that we can even enforce a local energy inequality? So this goes back to an idea in this uh, uh, paper by Phil initially. And the idea is that if I go back and look at my um, um, solution of the Euler equations, right, um, with an error term. So what I was trying to do, I was trying to get my uh, solution V as a limit of this system. And now what I should do, I should actually add the energy inequality to in here and treat it as an extra identity. And I'm actually going to treat it as an extra identity, which also has a, um, uh, uh, a, 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 a narrow, okay? So, what I'm actually going to do over here is I am writing in here, what should be the energy inequality, which I would like to get. So that is what I would like to get. Uh, and like, look at how far I am from it by introducing another field, which is giving me another error in a divergence form, right? So first of all, I will have an inequality because I will actually be dissipating. And here I will have terms which look natural. So one term for instance is going to be the following. Okay, but then there will be an additional one. And let me put it in uh, um, in uh, blue too, I mean, there will be an additional one which actually looks like the renal stress, our circle Q. It's again something which is accounting for, you know, how far I am from uh, 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 from actually having an, an, an energy inequality, right? And you will see that if our circle Q is going to zero, as it happens in the iteration, of course, this term is going to zero. So of course this guy is vanishing, 
and I don't have to bother about it. And what I actually should take care if I have this extra identity is that I have to devise my perturbation in such a way that not only the circle Q is going to zero, that I was able to do with the old iteration, but I should actually devise my uh, uh, perturbation in such a way that phi Q is also going to zero, okay? And the observation of feel is that what do you have at your disposal actually to do that? Well, what you have at your disposal is again the nonlinearity, right? So I'm, I'm running again the same idea. So I'm taking UQ, I'm adding something which is fast oscillating. I'm going to kill the derivative on the fast oscillations. Uh, and then I'm left with like slow derivatives and all the slow derivatives which do not resonate, I can actually kill by this sort of stationary phase argument because I'm inverting the divergence. But whereas in the first equation, I have this quadratic term, which I cannot kill, uh, in the second equation over here, I actually have trilinear term, which I cannot kill, right? So all of these terms over here, they will give you resonances. And so what, I, what I'm actually going to do is I'm using resonances at the level of uh, a trilinear expression in my Fourier uh, uh, modes to kill the phi q in my perturbation. So what I'm what, I, what I'm going to have is that so uh, 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 resonances um, on the cubic term will kill my error phi q. Okay, and, and so in the end, somehow I will actually have to devise the same iteration, but I will, what I will have to do is take more care algebraically to not only prescribe what is actually uh, the resonances at the uh, uh, level of the bilinear interaction, but I will actually need to actually prescribe what the resonances are also at the trilinear interaction. Okay, um, so I didn't try to actually see what this would mean if we were able to uh, uh, reach the Onsager scaling, but I, I, I bet that would be actually something interesting over there, even at the qualitative level. Anyhow, let me go back at the initial comment, uh, which I did at the beginning. And the initial comment was that um, uh, in a lot of the literature, somehow uh, the attention was focused on the fact that, um, you know, you're using Beltrami flows or you're using like, you know, Mikado or you're using this thing or that other device or this way of doing the estimates. That is, of course, all nice, and without all these, like, you know, technical devices, we wouldn't be able to reach uh, uh, the Onsager theorem, but there's something uh, fundamentally more general about the toolbox that we assembled, and the fundamentally more general toolbox is that, for instance, um, this iteration scheme uh, does not have any, anything to do with the quadratic uh, nature of the nonlinearity, right? So, um, I've just shown you an example, and a gladding example, in which um, what I'm using is instead of the quadratic term in the linearity is a cubic term to actually cancel my phi q. And so what I claim is that uh, that is much more into it than just what you know looks at first when you uh, uh, read the paper at uh, the technical level, uh, which of course is uh, some of the things that uh, drive uh, uh, our uh, as mathematicians, but that sometimes actually distracts us too. Okay, so and with that, I think I uh, have finished my time for the talk. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Camille, for your nice uh, talk. Um, are there some questions? Uh, yes, Riel. Yes, you can. You can speak, Riel, if you want. Yes, uh, I see you, Riel. Uh, you met maybe Riel. Do you want to ask a question? Are you speaking to me? Yes. Yeah, yes. There's uh, only one Oriel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine, fine. Uh, of course, um, I'm. Um, if I understood you well, is that uh, you are a bit reluctant, and, and I share this, this reluctancy to just add viscosity and let the viscosity go to zero. Hmm? 
Um, oh, no, no, I'm not reluctant, actually. I would love to do that. I would love to have viscosity going to zero. More that, that reluctance is dumbness. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> no, 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 of course. Uh, yeah. And um, so uh, you, you want to have a magic ingredient that allows you to stay purely with the Euler equation and it, it being dissipative if I understood you well. Um, no, 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 no. And, and actually, I would really love to prove that there's, um, I, I really would love to prove the thing that I stated at the beginning, you know, that you get a sequence of um, solutions to Navier-Stokes, which are converging to some of these solutions of Euler, which are crazy. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I, I mean obviously, my, my, my point is simply, you can't hope to do it for everybody. That is also a Finn's point of view. And one thing that you would like to have is at least a local mechanism for energy dissipation. What I'm just pointing out is, uh, I don't know, maybe if we understand uh, that mechanism uh, uh, better, maybe uh, uh, we can address um, the issue of adding viscosity. But I'm definitely not reluctant to do that. It's just I, I don't know how. Yeah, but then uh, the question, uh, of course, arises uh, uh, particularly in the context of what uh, Claude Bardot was saying uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, what about boundaries? Because they, they can yeah. be crucial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, so there I have even less ideas on, 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 uh, on what you would actually even like to do. Let me see if I can get Claude in an excited mode there on this question. Is Claude around? Uh, Claude, are you on? There we go, man. What do you remember for, for your program, Camille? What I remember from your program is really to look at the reminder of the renal stress tensor as the divergence of the Laplacian. Yeah. That's really what you do in some sense. Well, that's what I would like to do. Well, say, yeah. some, naive but, thing, some naive thing that you could attempt is just to say, okay, uh, okay, I got that I, I like to do the hand waving thing, but then <laughs> the meantime, you need, because experience has been do, uh, shown in all your Mikado or other, other things, to make it both very local in space and very high frequency, which is against the Heisenberg principle, or you have to saturate that in some sense. And uh, then, going back to the idea of Uriel, that would mean that in the boundary layer, in the prime layer, you should construct something which sits in the turbulent layer, in the scale of, which is uh, find out more explicitly by Drivas and uh, Inc. in such a way to put some Mikado there, some and that Mikado order in this region. Uh, um, I wait, it's wait, just what I remember. Okay, that's... There's an echo. Okay, I don't have the... Okay, I, I turn off my microphone. Yeah, sorry, probably the echo was because I actually kept my microphone open. Um, uh, yes, uh, I, I, so I would definitely like to, uh, um, to make this, um, you know, error to be compatible with the viscosity. Uh, and, um, well, I'm, I'm less expert on, uh, on, on, on the effect of, or like, I'm actually completely ignorant on the effect of um, uh, boundaries that, you know, should have on this. But um, at least when I open your books, guys, I at the beginning I don't see uh, uh, the boundary layers or stuff like that. Just I just see the things on fully developed tournaments, and you're telling me that uh, this thing should happen actually in the interior, and that's what I'm uh, trying to focus most. Yeah, actually, can I can I just bounce uh, back to uh, the physicists because. Uh, as Camilo already said, I mean, 
all the K41 uh, um, deviations from that stuff is about homogeneous isotropic turbulence deviations thereof, no boundary layer. So, I mean, is that so? What, so, what is the connection of that turbulent uh, boundary layer? Charlie's nodding. I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat it? I mean, so the, the connection of the, the boundary layer. Yes, so suppose you have a turbulent boundary layer, but there's a terrible echo. Uh, people who are not speaking should disconnect their microphones. So, so the, the question is sort of, uh, uh, suppose there is a turbulent boundary layer uh, and you are looking inside this boundary layer. Do you see, I mean, can you even define an energy spectrum restricted to the boundary layer? And the, is it related to the, the K41 theory? Well, yes, I mean, actually, I mean, it depends on how close you get, but people see uh, Komogorov spectra in, in flows like pipes. Um, uh, in the in what's called the log layer, so um, uh, uh, Smit at at uh, Princeton has seen this in his super pipe experiment. Um, they've even done studies recently of the four fifths law. Uh, you know, there have been a couple of recent studies of the four fifths law in pipe flow at the center line of the pipe, and you do approach four fifths, but very very slowly. So even in homogeneous isotropic, it's hard to see a good four-fifths law. It's even harder in, in uh, an inhomogeneous flow like pipe flow. But all evidence is that, yes, you do see those things far enough away from the boundary. Far enough away from the boundary being the key. Yeah. <laughs> ah, well, then if it's far enough away from the boundary, then. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you have to you have to go outside a few you know viscous units. I mean, so this is scaling. The this is uh, viscosity. The, the this is a length scale proportional to the viscosity and divided by what's called the friction velocity. But when you mm -hmm. get into the log layer, which happens, you know, like fifty or sixty of those lengths away from the wall, that's when you start to see the standard K forty one type phenomenology. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, uh, I guess, Greg, what you tried, what you started at the beginning to say, that there are some other universality in boundary layers, which has nothing to do with the MG spectrum, and this is the log law, etc. But that's Absolutely. not what, the, but that was not the question of Laszlo. I think the question of Laszlo was about MG spectrum that a la K41, which is about homogeneous isotropic turbulence away from boundary effects. No, I think I mean I, I understood the answer of Charlie. It was basically so if you are away sufficiently far, away, I mean a long long distance to me is like uh, you know infinitely far in terms of the analysis, uh, and so there you see the, K, the let's say the four fifth law, and then the question for us I guess is how to you know glue that construction to a boundary where it will have to obey a different uh, different uh, uh, power law spectrum. Actually, I had a question. So, I mean, there's been recent work by Daneri and Runa and, and Laszlo where they have shown the, the sort of the non-uniqueness, the sort of the density of wild initial data for the, um, uh, the exponents up to one third. And I guess that has not been shown yet for the kind of solutions that you want to, to get, which are locally dissipative. They've only looked at admissible solutions. I guess, is this your hope, is to try to prove um, a similar type of, of uh, or one of your hopes to prove such uh, uh, non-uniqueness also for locally dissipative? Yeah, so uh, let me comment on that. So non-uniqueness is, so, so we also prove non-uniqueness in, this, in these guys. And actually I should have pointed out, maybe I, I sorry, I forgot to do that. Um, so I quoted Phil in, in, in 2019, but actually we had uh, a dissipative solutions of Euler already uh, in our, um, in one of our uh, uh, papers with Laszlo in 2009. Um, I should have pointed that out. So we knew that kind of the, philosophy of these iterations is actually able to give you 
um, an, a local energy inequality. And it's able to give you many solutions with a local energy inequality. Uh, but that paper with Laszlo back in 2009 was only constructing bounded solution, was, wasn't able to actually get to any continuous solution. And so this, uh, this work by Phil is uh, um, uh, considerably more complicated. And, and, and it has uh, this wonderful new idea of having this trilinear interaction. Um, so what I would really like to do first is actually to reach the one over three exponent um, with these locally distributed solutions, which I, I, I can't yet do. I, and and, and um, as I said, uh, one of the reasons is that um, the most sophisticated tools that um, we're using for the one over three in the uh, globally distributive somehow when, when we're handling the global energy inequality um, does not seem to match uh, uh, this new, uh, uh, this new uh, construction. I mean, for instance, if, if we start gluing, um, so now here I'm going maybe too much into the technicalities, but I mean, for people who know this or uh, for people who remember uh, uh, Professor Matsumoto's talk, so there was a step in which we were actually gluing actual solutions of the Euler equation back and forth. And when we start gluing uh, uh, solutions of the Euler equations back and forth, this third uh, condition, which is the proxy for the local energy inequality, gets completely destroyed by uh, the gluing. And I don't know how to do that. And I guess Phil doesn't know how to do that either. Um, aside from that, uh, the density is probably achievable. So I, I, I didn't try to do that with Hyunju, and I don't know if Phil is trying to do that in his paper. As far as I remember, he's not. Um, but before, like, be, 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 before uh, looking at that, I would be uh, uh, first keen to actually get to the um, end point. Okay, thank you. I guess, what, could I make a comment also about, I, I think about this uh, RQ. I mean, there's actually a lot of, of knowledge that we have about it from experiment. I mean, it's something which you can assess in an experiment or even in simulation by taking a Navier-Stokes turbidant solution and then coarse graining it. You, you apply a low pass filter and, um, uh, and then you can get out essentially what happens in a real turbidant flow for the actual RQ. And although it might appear to be quite arbitrary, it's in some ways extremely predictable. Um, okay. You can actually look at only the low pass filtered velocity field and say what that object will be um, with a, a simple model that correlates with the true answer to like, you know, 95% level. Um, so it, there is, Non you know, there is arbitrariness to it. There's some additional stochasticity to it, but to a very high degree, it's actually quite predictable. Um, that, that would be very interesting to me. So we have to actually continue this conversa conversation somewhere else then. So, so because we could of course test what, what, what kind of informations you have over there and whether it looks plausible in, in our RQs. Of course, I, you know, I was cheating, obviously. So I was telling you all the things that seem to match with the books in turbulence. I was obviously carefully avoiding anything which doesn't match, right? So <laughs> it doesn't match that, for instance, I said honestly that it doesn't match that the uh, frequencies are not uh, growing exponentially. So they don't do that. They're double exponential. But one thing I didn't mention that it does not do is that, well, I guess you're expecting uh, uh, the spectrum to be kind of very evenly distributed among different uh, Fourier modes, right? So our current constructions, uh, which is which was hinted by 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 my um, like you know formulas, takes like you know a few uh, finite number, a few uh, type of you know modes, which could be the jets or the Beltrami, but you're just a few of them, and then like you know spikes them, right? So in yeah. in, in well, when you when you look at each shell, of course, they're actually very kind of localized among certain type of frequencies. Well, the Mikado they're more distributed because their Fourier expansion is not that bad. But for instance, the, the Beltrani would just really be a few excited modes, and most of the Fourier shell is actually not touched by our construction. And I guess that is absolutely far from what you would expect, right? Yes, actually, I mean, in fact, these are closely related remarks because the 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 form that you get from that, that, that agrees extremely well with simulations is what you get when you, when you do your low pass filter, it comes from the next highest Fourier modes, you know, mm -hmm. like a factor of two higher wave number. And that completely dominates 
the the actual RQ. Um, it's you know sort of the ultra local part uh, from the next adjacent Fourier band, and the uh, this actually gives right as Beru and Orsog found in numerical simulations. I mean this is extremely well correlated with the real quantity. Uh, it also has a nice physics because then you find that the energy dissipation, the fact that on average you get dissipation is connected with the fact that you have vortex stretching. And so in <laughs> fact, this term has a really simple physical meaning. And, okay. And anyway, that, that's just a comment. Okay, I have a last question maybe uh, if I have time. So uh, I wonder in your last construction, in your last theorem, uh, could, uh, could you replace local energy uh, inequality by uh, local entropy inequality to construct a um, wide solution for uh, hyperbolic conservation law? Um, uh, uh, okay, so, um, so there's, I, I've got a bright student together with my postdoc looking into this actually. Okay. <laughs> so my answer to this is uh, we can do something. So we, we can do something on hyperbolic conservation laws, but but it's so far not very uh, not very uh, hyperbolic conservation lowy, meaning that what we can do is like you know we can like subdivide uh, the space into sectors. And, and like run the convex integration in the sectors and then like, you know, match the boundary uh, um, of the sectors in such a way that you actually have dissipation on, on, on the discontinuities, right? So we can do that. And that has been done uh, uh, together with a former student of mine, Elisabetta Chiudaroli and um, uh, a former postdoc of mine, uh, Andre Krem. And you can run and uh, you know show non uniqueness and so on. But these constructions are are, are all uh, you know with, with some actual discontinuities. They're not going to be uh, uh, any continuous. So it's already an interesting question whether you can actually run continuous. Um, um, you know you, you can devise continuous solutions in hyperbolic conservation laws, which are like dissipating entropy, for instance. That is what these guys are looking into it, and I think that should be doable. Um, uh, whether you can really run this iteration, I uh, at the moment I don't know, but that's um, uh, that's what um, um, these people are trying. Okay, because uh, the entropy is no more uh, quadratic, or cubic. Yeah, I mean you don't. Uh, yeah, the flux. It's, yeah, there's a flux. Yes, there's a flux. Yes. So the flux is more uh, complicated. Uh, interaction, uh, I imagine, must be Absolutely. more complicated than cubic. Absolutely. Though, if you, if you, I mean, if you make a first expansion, like, you know, the first important term is actually cubic. Okay. Yeah. It's actually cubic, right? So, I mean, this is like one of the things that you, uh, uh, I mean, like it's, it's cubic if, uh, well, it's not always cubic, but say if, if there's some kind of non-degeneracy condition, like for instance, on the shock that you're looking at, right? So uh, it, 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 it looks like cubic for instance, on the shocks. So it's, it's more complicated, but I would say it's not even, uh, um, it's, it's not too far, hopefully. Okay, okay thank you. And, and that of course would like, you know, bring uh, um, more, uh, um, you know, more to my argument that I claim that this method is much more general. So, so far anyway, uh, you know, we were handling quadratic things and, and, and in this case we are handling cubic things, but I don't think actually is limited. I mean, as, 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 as soon as you have a reasonable nonlinearity, I think you should be able to run uh, a sort of a similar uh, approach to the problems. But you expect that the, the index decrease with uh, the high order of nonlinearity or something like that? I mean, the, the both, um, I mean, the the order of the non-linearity is uh, linked with the index of uh, regularity or not? I, oh, 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 okay. Uh, I honestly don't know at this point. Uh, it's tempting to say... It's no. tempting to say that it, that it, there is something in there, but I honestly don't know. My honest Claude, answer is that Claude, I don't know. Claude, say something. <laughs> <laughs> Claude was saying no. <laughs> He's convinced right. about that. It's that it's not. Well, I guess the the the, the other Ansager theorem sort of you generally get one third, right? So this yes. is what Claude was saying the other day in his talk. So, so yes. if you ask about the condition for conservation, of course, that's typically one third. Yes. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. For yes, I mean, sure. That 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 thing was that he was doing. But but okay. So I think uh, Nicolas um, Nicolas' question was like a deeper into. Um, uh, sure, I mean that I know perfectly well that the proof of uh, of conservation is, is is going with the same numerology, um, but I'm less sure about these constructions, right? So, and and I I, I can imagine that in some situations the, non, the nonlinearity might affect how efficient these constructions are. Okay, so, you're, so, so I'm not right. claiming there's something into it. I mean, it might only be technical. Right. So you're saying okay. So that's what I was going to ask next: is you, whether you think there might really be a gap or whether. Well, uh, so now here, <laughs> so now here, yeah. like, I, 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 I can add like, something. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I believe there might be something difficult in there. Now, if you're asking me whether this is only a technical limitation of what we're doing, or you know, there's something deeper into it, this goes even beyond my 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 uh, grasp. I mean, look, honestly, is that uh, honestly is that like you know, I'm 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 barely sure of the things I prove. I mean, sometimes I even find back mistakes in what I've proved. So, <laughs> and no. something that I cannot prove is we're really on a speculative uh, regime. <laughs> okay, if I can add add something, yes, okay. at, yes absolutely. At at some point in your series of paper, in the older one, you prove that you can construct wild solutions which are locally singular, locally wild, but you don't prove the one third. I mean, you, sat you saturate the convex integration in a small domain. So, and this seems to work also for the compressible uh, problem, uh, just to say the same way you can construct local perturbation of the or local locally wild solution the, and of course if the if the thing is more regular than one third then there is no dissip energy dissipation now the question about the one third i wonder if it is not really related to the incompressible fluid that the way and a, a simpler way to look at that is to ask, ask you if you could construct local solution that would be locally wide and that will still be regular up to one third. Is there a possibility to localize the one third criteria even for the, for the incompressible? Um. Yeah, well, okay, so yeah, in the incompressible, we can make it compactly supported, so certainly we can localize it. Um, now, in the compressible, uh, well, we don't we don't yet have a continuous construction anyway, so that's certainly harder to uh, to uh, to answer. Okay. I'm, I'm I'm afraid to most of the questions, I can only say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, <Yeah>, but. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a good sign. <laughs> if there is no more question, uh, we can thank uh, all the speakers of this session. And. Uh,